story one of the human boy and the war this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by david wales the human boy and the war by eden philpotts story one the battle of the sand pit after the war had fairly got going naturally we thought a good deal about it and it was explained to us by fortescue that behind the theory of germany licking us or rots licking germany as the case might be there were two great psychical ideas as i was going to be a soldier myself the actual fighting interested me most but the psychical ideas were also interesting because fortescue said that often the cause won the battle therefore it was better to have a good psychical idea behind you like us than a rotten one like germany i always thought the best men and the best ships and the best brains and the most money were simply bound to come out top in the long run but fortescue said that a bad psychical idea behind these things often wrecks the whole show and so i asked him if we had got a good psychical idea behind us and he said we had a champion one whereas the germans were trusting to a perfectly deadly psychical idea which was bound to have wrecked them in any case even if they'd had twenty million men instead of ten so that was all right though no doubt the germans think their idea of being top dog of the whole world is really finer than ours which is live and let live and as i pointed out to fortescue no doubt if we had such a fearfully fine opinion of ourselves as the germans have then we also should want to be top dog of the world and fortescue said that's just it travers major thanks to our sane policy of respecting the rights of all men and never setting ourselves up as the only nation that counts we do count first and foremost but if we'd gone out into the whole world and bawled that we were going to make it anglo-saxon then we should have been laughed at as the germans are now and we should dismally have failed as colonists just as they have so of course i saw all he meant by his psychical idea and no doubt it was a jolly fine thought and most though not all of the sixth saw it also but the fifth saw it less and the fourth didn't see it at all the fourth were in fact rather an earthy lot about this time and they seemed to have a foggy sort of notion that might is right or if it isn't it generally comes out right which to the minds of the fourth amounted to the same thing the war naturally had a large effect upon us and according as we looked at the war so you could judge of our opinion in general i and my brother travers minor and briggs and saunders though briggs and travers minor were themselves in the lower fourth were interested in the strategy and higher command we foretold what was going to happen next and were sometimes quite right whereas chaps like abbott and blades and mitchell and pegram and rice were only interested in the brutal part and the bloodshed and the grim particulars about the enemy's trenches after a sortie and so on in time curiously enough there got to be two war parties in the school of course they both wanted england to win but we took a higher line about it and looked on to the end and argued about the division of the spoil and the general improvement of europe and the new map and the advancement of better ideas and so on while rice and pegram and such like took the horrible slaughter line and rejoiced to hear of parties surrounded and uhlans who had been eating hay for a week before they were captured and the decks of battleships just before they sank and such like necessary but very unfortunate things i said to mitchell it may interest you to know that real soldiers never talk about the hideous side of war and it would be a good deal more classy if you chaps tried to understand the meaning of it all instead of wallowing in the dreadful details and mitchell answered the details bring it home to us and make us see red and i replied to mitchell what the dickens do you want to see red for and he said everybody ought to at a time like this of course with such ignorance you can't argue any more than you could with rice when he swore that he'd give up his home and family gladly in exchange for the heavenly joy of putting a bayonet through a german officer 
it wasn't the spirit of war and i told him so and he called me von travers and said that as i was going to be a soldier he hoped for the sake of the united kingdom in general there would be no war while i was in command of anybody gradually there got to be a bit of feeling in the air and we gave out that we stood for tactics and strategy and brain power and rice and his lot gave out that they stood for hacking their way through and as for strategy they had the cheek to say that if it came to actual battle the fourth would back its strategy against the sixth every time it was a sort of challenge in fact and rested chiefly on their complete ignorance of what strategy really meant when i asked mitchell who were the strategists of the fourth he gave it away by saying well, me and pegram well he and pegram were merely cunning nothing more mitchell was a good mathematician and in money matters he excelled on a low plane while pegram was admitted to be a master in the art of cribbing but no other his bent of mind had been attracted to the subject of cribbing from the first and while i hated him and knew that he could never come to much good i was bound to admit the stories told about his cribbing exploits showed great ingenuity combined with nerve by a bitter irony theology was his best subject but only thanks to the possession of a bible one inch square he had found it when doing christmas shopping with his aunt who was his only relation owing to his being an orphan and when he asked her to buy it for him as one of his christmas presents she did so with pleasure and surprise little dreaming of what was passing in his mind i never saw the book nor wished to see it but briggs who did told me it contained everything only in such frightfully small print that you wanted a magnifying glass to read it needless to say pegram had the magnifying glass and thus armed he naturally did scripture papers second to none he also manipulated a catapult for the benefit of his friends in the lower fourth of whom he had a great many and with this instrument such was his delicacy of aim he could send answers to questions in an examination through the air to other chaps in the shape of paper pillets he could also hurl insults in this way or in fact anything once he actually fired his bible across three rows of forms to abbott it flew through the air and fell at abbott's feet who instantly put one on it but brown who was the master in command on the occasion looked up at the critical moment and saw a strange object passing through the air only he failed to mark it down what was that said brown to rice who sat three chaps off abbott a moth i think sir said rice extraordinary time for a moth to be flying said brown very sir said rice don't let it occur again anyway said de brown who never investigated anything but always ordered that it shouldn't occur again no sir said rice then abbott bent down to scratch his ankle and all was well and this pegram was supposed to have strategy as good as ours i never thought a real chance of a conflict would come but it actually did in a most unexpected manner just before the holidays the weather turned cold for a week and then after about three frosts we had a big snow and in about a day and a night there was nearly a foot of it and walking through the west wood with blades i pointed out that the sand pit under the edge of the fir trees would be a very fine spot for a battle on a small scale i said if one army was above the sand pit and another army was down here trying to storm the position there would be an opportunity for a remarkably good fight and plenty of strategy and if i led the fifth and sixth against the sand pit or if i defended the sand pit against the attacks by the upper and lower fourth the result would be very interesting and blades agreed with me he said he believed that it would give the upper and lower fourth frightful pleasure to have a battle and he was certain they would be exceedingly pleased at the idea in fact he went off at once to find pegram and if possible rice and mitchell the school was taking a walk that afternoon as the football ground was eight inches under snow and some were digging in the snow for eating chestnuts of which a good many were to be found in west wood and others were scattered about so blades went to find mitchell rice and pegram and i considered the situation 
the edge of the sand pit was about eight feet high and a frontal attack would have been very difficult if not impossible but there was an approach on the left a gradual slope fairly easy and another on the right rather difficult as it consisted of loose stones and tree roots on the whole i thought i would rather defend than attack but as if anything came of it i should be the challenger i felt it would be more sporting to let the foe choose then rice and mitchell came back with blades and they said that nothing would give them greater pleasure than a fight they had heard my idea and thought exceedingly well of it they examined the spot and pretended to consider strategy but of course they knew nothing about the possibilities of defence and attack what they really wanted to know was how many troops they would have and how many we should we counted up and found that in the fifth and sixth leaving out about four who were useless and perkins who would have been valuable but was crocked at footer for the moment we should number thirty-one while the upper and lower fourth would have thirty-eight i agreed to that and rice made the rather good suggestion that we should each have ten kids behind the fighting line to make ammunition and i said i hoped there would be no stones in the snowballs and mitchell said the fourth didn't consist of germans and i might be sure they would fight as fair as we did if not fairer so it was settled for the next saturday and brown and fortescue consented to umpire the battle and fortescue showed great interest in it there were a good many preliminaries to decide and i asked mitchell what chap was to be general in chief for the fourth and much to my surprise he said that pegram was and still more to my surprise he said that pegram wished to attack and not defend this alone showed how little they knew about strategy but i only said all right and mitchell actually said that pegram backed the fourth to take the sand pit inside an hour and i said that pride generally went before a fall then i saw pegram which was at a meeting of the commander-in-chief and we arranged all the details he asked about the fallen and i said that nobody would fall but he said he thought some very likely would and he also said that it would be more like the real thing and more a reward for strategy if when anybody was fairly bowled over in the battle and prevented from continuing without a rest that that soldier was considered as a casualty and taken to the rear this was pretty good for pegram but as our superior position on the top of the sand pit was bound to make our fire more severe than his and put more of his men out of action i pointed that out but he said that if i thought our fire would be more severe than his i was much mistaken he said the volume of his fire would be greater which was true so i let him have his way and we each selected ten kids for the ammunition Travers Minor didn't much like fighting against me, but of course he had to, though it was rather typical of Mitchell and Pegram that they were very suspicious of him before the battle, and wouldn't tell him any of the strategy, or give him a command in their army for fear of his being a traitor. And they felt the same to Briggs, though of course Briggs and Travers Minor were really just as keen about victory for the fourth as anybody else in it and the only reason why my brother didn't like fighting against me was that with my strategy he felt pretty sure i must win the generals pegram and i visited the battlefield twice more and arranged where the wounded were to lie and where the umpires were to stand in comparative safety behind a tree on the right wing but of course we didn't discuss tactics or say a word about our battle plans the fight was to last one hour and if at the end of that time we still held the sand pit we were the victors and for half an hour before the battle began we were to make ammunition and pile snow and do what we liked to increase the chances of victory i of course led the fifth and sixth and under me i had saunders as general of the sixth and norris as general of the fifth as for the enemy pegram was a generalissimo to use his own word and rice and abbott and mitchell and blades were his captains it got jolly interesting just before the battle and everybody was frightfully keen and the kids who were not doing orderly and red cross work were allowed to stand on a slight hill fifty yards from the sand pit and watch the struggle and on the morning of the great day happening to meet rice and mitchell i asked them what was the psychical idea behind the attack of the fourth 
and rice said his psychical idea was to give the sixth about the worst time it had ever had and mitchell said his psychical idea was to make the sixth wish it had never been born they meant it too for there was a lot of bitter feeling against us and i realized that we were in for a real battle though there would only be one end of course they had thirty-eight fighters to our thirty-one and they had rather the best of the weight and size but in the sixth we had forbes and forrester both of the first eleven and hard chuckers and we had three other hard chuckers and first eleven men in the fifth besides williams who was the champion long-distance cricket ball thrower in the school we had all practiced a good deal and also instructed the kids in the art of making snowballs hard and solid the general feeling with us was that we had the brains and the strategy while the fourth had rather the heavier metal but would not apply it so well as us when a man fell the ambulance in the shape of two red cross kids was to conduct him to a place safe from fire in the rear and when he was being taken from the firing line he was not to be fired at but the battle was to go on though the red cross kids were to be respected i should like to draw a diagram of the field like the diagrams in the newspapers but that i cannot do i can however explain that when the great moment arrived i manned the top of the sand pit with my army and during the half hour of preparation threw up a wall of snow all along the front of the sand pit nearly three feet high and along this wall i arranged the fifth led by norris on the right wing five men commanded by saunders specially guarded the incline on the left which was our weak point and the remaining ten men all from the sixth took up a position five yards to the rear and above the front line in such a position that they could drop curtain fire freely over the fifth i being the grand staff took up a position on the right wing on a small elevation above the army from which i could see the battle in every particular and thwaites of the sixth who was too small and weak to be of any use in the fighting lines was my adjutant to run messages and take any necessary orders to the wings as for the enemy they made no entrenchments or anything of the kind though they watched our dispositions with a great deal of interest pegram studied the incline on our wing and evidently had some ideas about a frontal attack also which would certainly mean ruin for him if he tried it as it would have been impossible to rush the sand pit from the front they made an enormous amount of ammunition and as they piled it within thirty yards of our parapet they evidently meant to come to close quarters from the first i was pleased to observe this they arranged their line rather well in a crescent converging upon our wings but there was no rear guard and no reserve so it was clear everybody was going into action at once the officers were distinguished by wearing white footer shirts which made them far too conspicuous objects and it was clear that pegram was not going to regard himself as a grand staff but just fight with the rest needless to say i was prepared to do the same and throw myself into the thickest of it if the battle needed me and things got critical but i felt somehow from the first that we were impregnable well the battle began by fortescue blowing a referee's football whistle and instantly the strategy of the enemy was made apparent they opened a terrific fire and their one idea evidently was to annihilate the sixth they ignored the fifth but poured their entire fire upon the sixth and a special firing party of about six or seven chosen shots or sharpshooters poured their entire fire on me where i stood alone about ten snowballs hit me the moment fortescue's whistle went and the position at once became untenable and also dangerous so i retired to the sixth and sent word to the fifth by thwaites to very much increase the rapidity of their fire which they did and pegram appealed that i was out of action but fortescue said i was not it was exceedingly like the great war in a way and the fourth evidently felt to the fifth and sixth what the germans felt to the french and english they merely hated the fifth but they fairly loathed the sixth and wanted to put them all out of action in the first five minutes of the battle needless to say they failed 
but we lost saunders who somehow caught it so hot guarding the slope that he got winded and his nose began to bleed at the same moment which was a weakness of his brought on suddenly by a snowball at rather close range so he fell and the red cross kids took him out of danger this infuriated us and keeping our nerve well we concentrated our fire on mitchell who had come far too close after the success with saunders a fair avalanche of snowballs battered him and he went down and though he got up instantly it was only to fall again and fortescue gave him out and he was conducted to a ruined cowshed where the enemy's ambulance stood in the rear of their lines i had already ordered the sixth to take open formation and scatter through the fifth and this undoubtedly saved them for though we lost my aide-de-camp thwaites who was no fighter and nearly fainted and was jolly glad to be numbered with those out of action for some time afterwards we lost nobody and held our own with ease once or twice i took a hand but it wasn't necessary and when we fairly settled to work we made them see they couldn't live within fifteen yards of us they made several rushes however but by a happy strategy i always directed our fire on the individual when he came in and thus got two out of action including rice he was a great fighter and i was surprised he threw up the sponge so soon but after a regular battering and blinding he said he'd got it in the neck and fell and was put out with one eye bunged travers minor also fell rather to my regret and what struck me was that considering all their brag the fourth were not such good plucked ones when it came to the business of real war as we were it made a difference finishing off rice for he had fought well and his fire was very accurate as several of us knew to our cost i felt now that if we could concentrate on pegram and blades who were firing magnificently the battle would be practically over but blades owing to his great powers could do execution and still keep out of range he was in fact their seventeen-inch gun you might say and though williams on our side could throw further he proved in action rather feeble and not a born fighter by any means as for pegram he always seemed to be behind somebody else which knowing his character you would have expected at last however he led a storming party to the slope and leaving the bulk of my forces to guard the front i led seven to stem his attack for the first time since the beginning of the battle it was hand to hand but we had the advantage of position and were never in real danger i had the great satisfaction of hurling pegram over the slope into his own lines and he fell on his shoulder and went down and out he was led away holding his elbow and also limping but his loss did not knock the fight out of the fourth though in the same charge they lost preston and we nearly lost bassett but he got his second wind and was saved to us though only for a time for blades who had a private hate of bassett came close and scorned the fire and got three hard ones in on bassett from three yards and fortescue had to say bassett was done blades however was also done and there was a brief armistice while they were taken away we now suddenly concentrated on mitchell who was tiring and had got into range i think he was fed up with the battle for after a feeble return he went down when about ten well-directed snowballs took him simultaneously on the face and chest and then he chucked it and went to the ambulance at the same moment one of their chaps called sutherland did for norris norris had been getting giddy for some time and he also feared that he was frostbitten and when sutherland creeping right under him got him well between the eyes with a hard one he was fairly blinded though very sorry to join our casualties i had a touch of cramp at the same moment but it passed off we'd had about half an hour now and five of the ammunition kids were out of action with frozen hands then we got one more of the enemy in the shape of sutherland and their moral ought to have begun to get bad but it did not though all their leaders were now down they stuck it well while we simply held them with ease and repelled two more attempts on the slope 
in fact williams wanted to go down and make a sortie and get a few more out of action but this i would not permit for another five minutes though during those exciting moments we prepared for the sortie and knocked out abbott who much to my surprise had fought magnificently and covered himself with glory though lame on their side they got mcandrew owing to an accident in fact he slipped over the edge of the sand-pit and was taken prisoner before he could get back and we were sorry to lose him not so much for his own sake as because his capture bucked up the fourth to make fresh efforts and then came the critical moment of the battle and a most unexpected thing happened with victory in our grasp and a decimated opposition a frightful surprise occurred and the most unsporting thing was done by the fourth that you could find in the gory annals of war it was really all over bar victory and we were rearranging ourselves under a very much weakened fire when we heard a shout in the woods behind us and the shout was evidently a signal for the whole of the fourth still in action made one simultaneous rush for the slope and of course we concentrated to fling them back but then with a wild shriek there suddenly burst upon us from the rear the whole of their casualties mitchell and rice and pegram came first followed by travers minor and preston and blades and sutherland and abbott they had rested and refreshed themselves with two lemons and other commissariat and then taking a circuitous track from behind their ambulance had got exactly behind us through the wood and now uttering the yells that the regular tommies always utter when charging they were on us with frightful impetus just while we were repelling the frontal attack on the slope and before we had time to divide to meet them in fact they threw the whole weight of a very fine charge on to us and fairly mowed us down there was about a minute of real fighting on the slope and blood flowed freely we got back into the fort so to say but the advancing fourth came back too and the casualties took us in the rear then unfortunately for us i was hurled over the sand-pit and three chaps all defenders came on top of me and half the snowbank we had built came on top of them with the snowbank gone it was all up i tried fearfully hard to get back but of course the fourth had guarded the slope when they took it and in about two minutes from the time i fell out of our ruined fortifications all was over in fact the fourth was now on the top of the sand-pit and the shattered fifth and sixth were down below one by one our men were flung or fell over and then fortescue advanced from cover with brown and blew his whistle and the battle was done we appealed but pegram said all was fair in war and fortescue upheld him and in a moment of rage i told pegram and mitchell they had behaved like dirty germans and mitchell said they might or they might not but war was war anyway and he also said that the first thing to do in the case of a battle is to win it and if you win then what the losers say about your manners and tactics doesn't matter a button because the rest of civilization will instantly come over to your side and blades said the sixth had still a bit to learn about strategy apparently and pegram showing what he was to a beaten foe offered to give me some tips mind you i'm not pretending we were not beaten because we were and the victors fought quite as well as we did but i shall always say that with another referee than fortescue they might have lost on a foul no doubt they thought it was magnificent but it certainly wasn't war at least not what i call war we challenged them to a return battle the next saturday and pegram said as a rule you don't have return battles in warfare but that he should be delighted to lick us again with other strategies of which he still had dozens at his disposal only pegram feared the snow would unfortunately all be gone by next saturday and the wretched chap was quite right it had mitchell by the way got congestion of his lungs two days after the battle showing how sickness always follows warfare sooner or later but he recovered without difficulty End of story one
story two of the human boy and the war by eden philpotts this librivox recording is in the public domain story two the mystery of fortescue my name is abbott and i came to merivale two years ago i have got one leg an inch and three quarters shorter than the other but i make nothing of it a nurse dropped me on a fender when i was just born owing to a mouse suddenly running across her foot it was more a misfortune than anything and my mother forgave her freely when i was old enough i also forgave her in fact i only mention it to explain why i am not going into the army all abbots do so and it will be almost a record my going into something else many chaps have no fighting spirit and as a rule it is not strong in schoolmasters yet when the call came for men three out of our five answered it and went two who were well up on the terriers got commissions and the other enlisted and so we were only left with brown who can't see further than a pink-eyed rat and isn't five foot three in his socks though in his high-heeled boots he may be and fortescue you will say this must have had a pretty bright side for us and at first sight no doubt it looks hopeful in fact we took a very cheerful view of it because you can do what you like with brown and fortescue only teaches the fifth and sixth on the day that hutchings cleared out to join the army and we were only left with fortescue brown and the doctor we were confronted with serious news in fact after chapel on that day we heard much to our anxiety that old dunston himself was going to fill the breach those were his very words he talked with a lot of ghastly funniness and used military terms he said now that our valued and honored friends mr hutchings mr manwaring and mr meadows have answered their nation's call with a loyalty to king and country inevitable in men who know the demands as well as the privileges of empire it behooves us as we can and how we can to fill their places this then is my contribution to the great war i shall fight in no foreign trenches but labor here sleeplessly if need be and undertake willingly proudly the arduous task that they have left behind i shall confront no cannon but i shall face the lower school henceforth after that amalgamation of class and class which will be necessary you may count upon your headmaster to answer the trumpet call and fill the breach but i do not disguise from myself that such labors must prove no sinecure and i trust the least as well as the greatest to do their part and aid me with good sense and intelligence well there it was and we saw in a moment that you can't escape the horrors of war even though you are on an island with the grand fleet between you and the foe when it came to the point the doctor was fairly friendly but there was always something about him that was awful and solemn and very depressing to the mind you could crib easily enough with him for he had a much more trustful disposition than hutchings or brown or fortescue and was also short-sighted at near range but the general feeling with the doctor was a sense of weariness and undoubted relief when it was over it was as near like being in church as anything could be beginning at the beginning of subjects bored him in fact he often found when he went back to the very start of a lesson he'd forgotten it himself moving for so many years on only the higher walks of learning and then finding that he had forgotten some footling trifle on the first page of a primer he became abstracted and lost heart about it and seemed more inclined to think than to talk another very curious habit he had was to start on one thing say latin and then drift off into something else say geography or he might begin with algebra and then something would remind him of the procession of the equinoxes or the nebula in orion and he would soar from earth and wander among the heavenly bodies until the class was over and if he happened to be very much interested himself he wouldn't let it be over and then we had to sit on hearing the doctor maundering about double stars or comets perhaps while everybody else was in the playground 
i think he got rather sick of the lower school after about a month of it and fortescue took over a good many of the classes in his normal style which was more business-like than the doctor and more punctual in its working fortescue was cold and hadn't much use for us in school or out but he was just and we liked him pretty well until the mystery began then we gradually got to dislike him and then despise him and then hate him he was rather out of the common in a way being an honourable and related to the famous family of fortescue which has shown a great deal in history off and on and of course when the war broke out we naturally expected that the honourable howard fortescue would seize the opportunity to shine also which he could not do as an undermaster at merivale he was a big fine man six feet high with a red complexion and a roman nose certainly he did not play games but he was all right in other ways and had been a lawn tennis player of the first class in past times at oxford and in fact got his half blue for playing at that sport against cambridge so it seemed to us pretty low down that he didn't join kitchener's army as a matter of fact he didn't even try to he was a very sublime sort of man and not what you might call friendly to us yet if anybody appealed to him in any sort of way he generally thawed a bit and responded in quite a kind manner we argued a good deal about him and travers major said it was natural pride because being of the family of fortescue he knew there was a gulf fixed between him and us and travers did not blame him and nor did i or briggs but rice who is irish and who got sent up on the report of fortescue for saying as he thought something disrespectful about the british army hated fortescue with a deadly hatred which was natural because fortescue had misunderstood and rice had really said nothing against the army but against protestants which being a roman catholic himself was merely his point of view and no business of fortescue's and when fortescue wouldn't become a soldier rice left no stone unturned as they say to worry about him at that time milly dunston the doctor's youngest daughter had just come back from a school where she had been finished and rice's sister was at the same school so she took notice of rice and it soon turned out that milly dunston also hated fortescue i believe he had snubbed her in some way over english literature at which fortescue was said to be a flyer but milly dunston was not she had in fact praised a novel to him and he had laughed and told her it was quite worthless and advised her to read some novels by people she had never heard of and then he had slighted the school where she had finished and so when rice explained that fortescue was a coward and preferred the comparative comfort of merivale to the manly business of going to salisbury plain and living in mud and becoming useful to the empire milly dunston quite agreed with rice and said something ought to be done about it we helped because we thought the same in fact everybody seemed to be of one opinion and little by little fortescue began to see signs of great unpopularity growing up against him at first he ignored these signs being evidently unprepared to take what you might call a delicate sort of hint for instance he smoked a pipe and kept a japanese vase on the mantelpiece of his study full of black crow's feathers which he was in the habit of picking up on merivale heath where he often went for lonely walks with these feathers he cleaned out the stem of his pipe well milly dunston bought a white fowl for the doctor's dinner and told the man at the shop to send it without plucking the feathers off which he did do and she got them and gave them to rice who dexterously took away fortescue's black feathers and substituted the white ones but fortescue went on just as though he hadn't noticed it and when saunders was with fortescue having his special coaching lesson for a civil service exam he said that fortescue took a white feather and cleaned his pipe with it as though quite indifferent to the colour then milly dunston got a ball of knitting wool and four knitting needles for all of which she paid herself and rice once more did the necessary strategy and arranged them on fortescue's desk where his eyes would fall upon them on returning to his study 
but they merely disappeared and fortescue gave no sign then travers major started a very interesting theory on the subject and he said there must be some reason far deeper than mere cowardice behind the mystery of fortescue he said that it was impossible for a fortescue to be a coward in the common or garden sense of funking danger but he admitted that he might be a coward in some other way such as not liking discipline or living in a tent or wearing uncomfortable clothes or getting up early to the sound of a bugle and briggs said that he thought perhaps fortescue was keeping a widowed mother and sister or an old aunt or some such person by his exertions at merivale in which case of course he couldn't go but rice didn't see why not even if it was so and nor did i because the government gives full compensation for women relations in general but briggs said i had got it all wrong and that if fortescue had an aunt she wouldn't gain a penny by his going to the war however old and poor she was in fact he believed that only a wife who was going to have a baby got anything at all owing to the great need for keeping up the race then rice said that it didn't make any difference to his deadly feeling against fortescue and he also said that he was going on rubbing it into fortescue and leaving no stone unturned to make his life a burden to him until he enlisted and travers major said that rice was feeling the instinct of pure revenge and rice said he might be but that was what he intended to do anyway he was sure the war office and admiralty didn't care a button about aunts then we divided into two factions on the subject of fortescue and one faction decided to leave him to his conscience and mind its own business which wasn't driving fortescue to war while the other side took the opposite course and decided to work at fortescue with the utmost ingenuity until in sheer despair he was driven to do his duty and briggs and travers major and travers minor and saunders and hopwood abandoned the pursuit so to say while i and rice and a chap called mitchell all ably assisted by milly dunston continued in our great attempt to wake fortescue to the call of his country and storm his lines as rice said as for mitchell he came into it rather curiously and it shows how an utter accident will sometimes reveal anybody in their true colours and surprise other people who thought they knew them and yet didn't mitchell was a mere rabbit in character and nothing in learning and in fact he only had one feature beside his nose and that was his love for money money you might say was his god and his financial operations in the matter of loans to the kids were a study in themselves but over fortescue he came out in a most unexpected manner and much to our surprise made up a bit of poetry about him which shows nothing happens but the unexpected and nobody was more astonished in a sort of way than mitchell himself because he never knew he could do it how to use the poem to the best purpose was a question that milly solved she typed it by night on her own typewriter and then directed rice at the first opportunity to put it on fortescue's desk when his study was empty and he did so and this is what fortescue found waiting him when he returned you ask us lots of questions and we answer if we can and now we'll jolly well ask you one you call yourself a man then why on earth don't you enlist and try to do your share where the black mariahs bellow and the shrapnels in the air and if you will not tell us why then we'll tell you instead it's just because you funk it and would hate to be shot dead in other words in fact in one most honourable howard though of the race of fortescue you are a bally coward we didn't much envy fortescue his feelings when he read these stirring lines and in fact i in my hopefulness believed they would actually win our object and start fortescue on the path of duty and rouse him from his lethargical attitude to the war but strange to say they went off him like water off a duck's back not a muscle moved so to speak or if it did nobody saw it do so he went on his way for all the world as if civilization was not in its death throes and then rice to show you what rice still felt about it 
offered mitchell a week's pocket money if he would write yet another poem of even a more fiery and stinging character and mitchell gladly agreed and took enormous trouble and burnt the midnight oil as the saying is and produced certainly a poem full of rhymes and great abuse of fortescue yet not nearly such a fine poem as the first and rice said it wasn't up to the mark and wouldn't pay for it and mitchell said it was a contract and written on commission and must be paid for by law but rice knew no law and he showed the poem to travers major who instantly tore it up and kicked mitchell next time he met him and told him he was a dirty little cad so mitchell cooled off to rice and in fact his next poem was actually about rice not written to order but for pure hate of rice and it was undoubtedly a bitter and powerful poem but rice being far stronger than mitchell made him eat it and swallow it in front of his class though it was written in red ink and mitchell said if he died rice would be hung but he felt no ill effects though he rather hoped he would at this season however a far greater and more splendid poem than any mitchell could do had appeared in england in fact it was set to music and england rang with it also ireland at least so rice said because his mother had told him so in a letter there was a special mention of ireland in it and rice's mother told him that it had made more recruits in ireland than mr redmond and sir edward carson put together rice never does anything by halves and he actually learnt the poem by heart and also found out the tune somehow and sang it when possible once in fact he woke up in the night singing it from force of habit as the saying is and his prefect who happened to be mactaggart said there was a time for everything and threatened to report rice if he did it again i asked rice why he had made such a great effort and learnt anything he wasn't obliged to learn and he said firstly because it was the grandest poem he had ever heard and secondly because he had a great idea some day to sing it to fortescue as it applied specially to him by dwelling on the fearfulness of hanging back when the empire cried out for you the poem said the empire was calling to every one of her sons of low and high degree and so of course it was also calling to fortescue and rice thought that as it was pretty certain fortescue wouldn't read it and no doubt fought shy of patriotic poetry in general just now he meant to wait for some happy opportunity when fortescue was not in a position to get out of earshot and sing it to him but the opportunity did not come so rice adopted the former plan of leaving the poem in fortescue's room he had plenty of printed copies of the words because the poem after first appearing in a london newspaper of great renown had been copied at the special wish of the author into hundreds and thousands of other papers and to show you the tremendous liking people had for it even the merivale weekly trumpet printed it and milly dunstan found it there she by the way had another pretty bitter cut at fortescue which cost more money and she told rice she had paid five shillings and sixpence for her great insult in fact she sent fortescue a shawl and a cap such as is worn by aged women with red white and blue ribbons in it which of course meant that fortescue was an old woman himself it was frightfully deadly if you understood it and rice said that only a girl could have thought of such a cruel thing the parcel was sent by post but once more we were doomed to disappointment as they say for nothing came of it except slight advantage to the matron in fortescue's house in fact he gave her the five shilling shawl but the cap we never saw again and doubtless it was burnt to a cinder in fortescue's fire then rice tried the patriotic poem and so as there should be no mistake he covered the back of it with paste and in this manner fastened it very firmly to the looking-glass just behind the spot where fortescue kept his pipes on the mantelpiece we didn't hope much from it and expected he would merely scrape it off and take it lying down in his usual cowardly manner but imagine our immense surprise when we found he had sneaked to the doctor and even that was nothing compared to the extraordinary confession that he had made to the doctor and it all came out and as mitchell said a bolt from the blue fell on him and me and rice 
after stating the facts of the case which were that mr fortescue had been from the beginning of the term subject to a great deal of annoyance from boys who laboured under the offensive delusion that he ought to go to the front the doctor said it is my honoured friend mr fortescue's wish that i inform you of the circumstances which prevent an action which he would have been the first to take did his physical welfare permit of it but unhappily he suffers from an enlarged aorta and it is impossible for him to take his place in our line of defences though that impossibility has caused him the sorrow of his life it happens however that nature has blessed mr fortescue with abundant gifts while denying him his health and in the pages of that work of reference known as who's who pages that i fear few among you will ever adorn may be found the distinguished name of the hon howard fortescue in connection with notable achievements for mr fortescue is a votary of the muses already he has two volumes of verse to his credit and three works of fiction while in a subsequent edition of the volume it will doubtless be recorded that he was the author of a certain admirable poem which has recently stirred the united kingdom to its depths and sent more young men to the enlisting station than any other inspiration of the time but it was it seems left for one of my pupils to combine idiocy with insolence and affix a copy of his own immortal composition to mr fortescue's looking-glass this was positively the last straw and my esteemed colleague who up to the present time has allowed his sense of humour to ignore your insufferable impertinences felt that it was bad for yourselves to proceed further upon so perilous a path very rightly therefore he called my attention to a persecution i should have thought impossible within these walls he has no desire to give me the names of the culprits and it is well for them that he has not but having placed the whole circumstances in my hands i cannot permit the outrage to pass without recording my abhorrence and shame i may further remind you that wednesday next is our half-term whole holiday and if before that date no private and abject apology is committed to the hands of mr fortescue by those who have disgraced themselves and put this affront upon him if that is not done and if i do not hear from him that he is thoroughly satisfied with the nature of that expression of regret then there will be no half-term whole holiday and righteous and guilty alike will suffer needless to say this tremendous speech made a very great impression on me and rice and mitchell milly dunstan did not hear it but it made a great impression on her too when she heard the facts and we felt in a way that she was a good deal to blame because she could easily have looked up who's who being free of the doctor's library which we were not of course there was no difficulty about the apology which i wrote with help from mitchell but showing what girls are though she had invented most of the things we did to fortescue she calmly refused to sign the apology and said she would apologize personally to him no doubt she did not and rice chucked her afterwards rice was the most cut up he said he should never feel the same again after being such a simple beast and he changed over from hating fortescue to thinking him the most wonderful and splendid man in the world and far the best poet after shakespeare and to show how frightfully rice feels things and the rash way he goes on i can only tell you that when we signed the apology he cut himself on his arm just above the wrist and got two drops of blood and signed with them and after his name he wrote the grim words his blood so that fortescue shouldn't think it was merely red ink the apology went like this we the undersigned members of the lower fourth form of merivale beg to express our great regret for having tried to make the honourable howard fortescue go to the front we freely confess we ought not to have done so and that we were much deluded we utterly did not know that he had got an aorta and we are very sorry that he has and we hope that he will soon recover from it and we beg to say that we think his poem the best poem we have ever heard and also better than virgil 
and we hope that he will overlook it on this occasion and are willing to do anything he may decide upon to show the extent of our great regret signed rupert mitchell patrick rice his blood arthur abbott but nothing came of it the honourable fortescue went on his way quite unmoved and treated us just as usual without any sign of forgiveness or otherwise and whether he ever reported our names to dunston or not we never knew but i don't think he did at any rate he must have said the apology was enough which it certainly was and the end justified the means as they say because the whole holiday at half term passed off as usual end of story two story three of the human boy and the war by eden philpotts this LibriVox recording is in the public domain story three the countryman of kant dr dunston had a way of introducing a new chap to the school after prayers the natural instinct of a new chap of course is to slide in quietly and slowly settle down first in his class and then in the school but old dunston doesn't allow this when a new boy turns up he jaws over him and prophesies about him and says we shall all like him and so on and if the new chap's father is anybody which he sometimes happens to be then dunston lets us know the result is that he generally puts everybody off a new chap from the first but the fifth and sixth allow for this as travers major pointed out it's a rum instinct of human nature to hate anything you are ordered to like and to scoff at anything you are ordered to admire so thanks to travers who is frightfully clever in his way and in fact going to woolwich next term we always allowed for the doctor's great hope about a new boy and didn't let it put us off him as a matter of fact dunston often withdrew the praise afterwards and we noticed for some queer reason that if a boy had a celebrated father he always turned out to be the sort that dunston hated most and often and often when he had to rag or flog that sort of boy the doctor fairly wept to think what the boy's celebrated father would say if he could see him now when jacob wundt came to merivale dunston just went the limit about him and it was all the more footling because wundt grinned and evidently highly approved of what was said about him he was the first german the doctor had ever had for a pupil i believe anyway the first in living memory so perhaps naturally he got a bit above himself about it and wundt got a bit above himself too in jacob wundt we embrace one from the hamlet among nations began dr dunston in jacob wundt we welcome the countrymen of kant and schiller the contemporary of eucken and harnack moreover colonel von wundt his esteemed parent occupies a position of some importance in the fatherland and has done no small part to perfect the magnificent army that great nation is known to possess well we looked at jacob wundt and saw one of the short fat sort with puddingly limbs and yellowish hair close cropped and a fighting sort of head he looked straight at you but he never looked at anybody as though he liked them and we jolly soon found he didn't as to dr dunston's german heroes we only knew one name and that was schiller but as the fifth and sixth happened to be swatting the robbers for an exam and as the robbers happens to be a ripping good thing in its way we were not disinclined to be friendly to wundt as far as the fifth and sixth can be friendly to a new boy low in the school we soon found that wundt was very un-english in his ideas also in his manners and customs he could talk english well enough to explain what he meant and we soon found that he thought a jolly sight too well of germany and a jolly sight too badly of england at first we thought he had been sent to merivale to make him larger-minded so that he could go back and make other germans more larger-minded too but he said it was nothing of the kind he hadn't come to england to learn our ways which were beastly in his opinion but to get perfect in our language which might be useful to him when he became a soldier he was very peculiar and did things i never knew a boy do before and the most remarkable thing he did was always to be looking on ahead to when he was grown up 
of course everybody knows they're going to grow up and some chaps are even keen about it in a sort of way but very few worry about it like wundt did i said to him once what the dickens are you always wanting time to pass for so that you may be grown up i can tell you it isn't all beer and skittles being a man at any rate i've often heard my father say he wishes he was young again he may answered wundt you've told me your father was an international and a blue and no doubt he'd like to excel at football again but i despise games and i've got very good reasons for wanting to grow up which are private of course he didn't put it in such good english as that but that was the sense of it he wasn't what you call a success generally for he didn't like work except history and he hated our history and there wasn't much going at merivale in the matter of german history but he took to english well and would always talk it if he could get anybody to listen which wasn't often he said it was all rot about english being a difficult language he thought it easy and feeble at best all his people could speak it in fact everybody in germany could when it suited them to do so as for games he had no use for them but he was sporting in his own way his favorite sport consisted in going out of bounds and he showed very decent strategy in doing so and gave even norris and booth a tip or two norris and booth had made a fair art of trespassing in private game preserves at the manor house and other places round about merivale in fact game preserves were just common or garden sunday walks to them and Bunt showed them how a reverse like that need never have happened. He could turn his coat inside out and do other things of that sort, which were very deceptive even to the trained gamekeeper eye, and finding a scarecrow in a turnip field, he took it, and as it consisted of trousers and coat and an old billycock hat, Wundt was now in possession of a complete disguise he hid the things in a secret haunt that really belonged to norris and booth and they liked him at first and helped him a good deal but finally they quarrelled with him because he said england was a swine's hole and told them that a time was coming he hoped not till he grew up when england would simply be a protectorate of germany whatever that is so they invited him to fight whichever he liked of them and when he refused though just the right weight they smacked his head and dared him to go to their secret cave again when they smacked his head his eyes glittered and he smiled but nothing more he never would fight with fists because he said only apes and englishmen fought with nature's weapons but at single stick he was exceedingly good and in fact better than anybody in the school but forrester he much wished we could use swords and slash each other's faces as he hoped to do when he became a student in his own country and he said it was a mean sight to see old dunston and brown and manwaring and hutchings and the other masters all without a scratch he said in germany every self-respecting man of the reigning classes was gashed to the bone and decent people wouldn't know a man who wasn't because he was sure to be a shopkeeper or some low-class thing like that as to games he held them in great contempt it seems people of any class in germany only play one game and that's the war game kriegspiel he called it i said what the deuce is the good of always playing the war game if you're not going to war and he said ah it was a favorite word of his and he used it in all sorts of ways with all sorts of expressions forbes who like me had a kind of interest in wundt that almost amounted to friendship asked him if women played the war game and he said he didn't know what they played except the piano all women were worms in his opinion of course he gasped about everything german and said that from science and art and music to matchboxes and sausages his country was first and the rest nowhere he joined our school cadet corps eagerly and became an officer of some sort in a month but he was fearfully pitying about it and said that english ways of drilling were enough to make a cat laugh or words to that effect after he became an officer he put on fearful side though as just one of the rank and file he had been quite humble and then when he ordered saunders who wasn't an officer to do something out of drill hours and saunders told him to do it himself he turned white and dashed at saunders who of course licked him on the spot and made his nose bleed 
he was properly mad about that and said that if it had happened in germany saunders would have been shot but as it happened in england of course saunders wasn't travers major tried to explain to wundt that we weren't real soldiers and that when not with the cadet corps he was no better than anybody else but he couldn't see this he said that in his country if you were once an officer you were always an officer and that there was a gulf fixed between the men and their officers and he called saunders cannon fodder to batson and when batson told saunders saunders made wundt carry him on his back up to the gym and there licked him again and made his nose bleed once more much to his wrath on the whole owing to his ideas which he wouldn't keep to himself wundt didn't have too good a time at merivale he couldn't understand us and said we were slackers and rotters and that our mercenary army was no good and that germany was the greatest country in the world and we'd live to know it perhaps sooner than we thought travers major tried hard to explain to him how it was but he couldn't or wouldn't understand travers said it's like this germany takes herself too seriously and other countries not seriously enough an englishman is always saying his own country is going to the dogs and his armies rotten and his navy only a lot of old sardine tins that ought to be scrapped and all that sort of thing that's his way and when you bally germans hear us talk like that you go and believe it and don't understand it's our national character to run ourselves down and you chaps always go to the other extreme and brag about your army and your guns and your discipline and your genius and all the rest of it and of course we don't believe you in the least because gas like that carries its own reward and nobody in the world could be so much better than all the rest of the world as you think you are and if you imagine because we run ourselves down we would let anybody else dare to run us down you're wrong and if you think our free army is frightened of your slave army and would mind taking you on ten to one on land or sea you're also wrong it was a prophecy in a way though travers little knew it for the war broke out next holidays and when we went back to school it was in full swing and so naturally was a wundt he wasn't going home for the back in any case but stopping at merivale and he had done so he told me the doctor had talked some piffle to him about the duties of non-combatants but as avunt truly said every german in the world is a combatant in time of war and if you can't do one thing you must try and do another in fact old dunston little knew the german character and when he found it out he was a good bit astonished not to say hurt he however discovered it jolly quickly and i did first of all because owing to being rather interested in human nature i encouraged wundt in a sort of way and let him talk to me and tried to see things from his point of view as far as i could that is without doing anything unsporting to england the great point was to keep your temper with wundt and of course most chaps couldn't because he was so beastly sure he was right at least his nation was but i didn't mind all that humbug and found by being patient with him that under all this flare-up he was what you might call deadly keen on his blessed fatherland he fairly panted with patriotism and in these moments quite ignored my feelings now you know why i wanted to grow up he said to me i hope this wouldn't have happened till i could be in it but it will be all over and your country a thing of the past before i'm sixteen worse luck as he was going to be sixteen in october that was a bit hopeful of wundt his father or somebody had stuffed him up that germany was being sat on by the world and couldn't stand it much longer and after the war began he honestly believed that it was the end of england and in a way he was more decent than ever he'd been before when we came back at the end of the holidays wundt welcomed me in a very queer sort of manner somebody had treated me just the same in the past and after trying for a week to think who it was i remembered it was my uncle samuel after i'd lost my mother wundt evidently felt sorry for all of us in general and for me in particular as his special friend of course he said i can't pretend i didn't want it to happen but you won't see it is for the good of the world that your country's got to go down and so i'm sorry for you if anything 
do you really think it has got to go down i asked wundt and he said it wasn't so much what he thought as what was bound to take place either england's got to go or else germany he said and as the teuton is the world power for religion and culture and everything that really matters and also miles strongest england's naturally got to go you've had your turn and now it's ours the kaiser speaks germany listens and obeys booth asked him what day the germans would be at merivale and if he'd got a plan of campaign marked out and he said about the half-term holiday or earlier they would come and booth said that would mean a short term anyway which had its bright side then tracy who is awful sarcastic though it doesn't generally come off asked wundt how he had arrived at this idea and wundt said from reading papers that his father had sent him via holland your papers are chock full of lies he said if you want the truth those of you who can read german can see it in my papers of course some of the six could read german and they followed his papers and were much surprised that wundt really believed such absolute rot against the evidence of our papers but he was simply blind and went so far as to say that he'd sooner believe the pettiest little german rag than all our swaggerest papers let alone the merivale weekly trumpet which was fearfully warlike because the editor had a son who was training for the front but most of all wundt hated punch and finding this out we used to slip the cartoons into his desk and put them under his pillow and arrange them elsewhere where he must find them these made him fairly foam at the mouth and he said he hoped the first thing the germans would do when they got to london would be to go to punch and put the men who drew the pictures and made the jokes to the sword no doubt it was because they were so jolly true the masters were very decent to wundt especially fortescue who saw how trying it must be for him living in an enemy's country and when wundt told me in secret that he felt his position was becoming unbearable and that he had written and asked if he could be exchanged for a prisoner or something he said in a gloomy sort of voice i may tell you i haven't wasted my time here and perhaps some day dr dunston and you chaps will know it to your cost well though friendly enough to wundt i didn't much like that and told my own special chum manwaring what he'd said and manwaring told me that in his opinion wundt ought to be neutralized immediately but i knew enough of wundt to feel certain he could never be properly neutralized because he had told me that once a german always a german and that he'd rather be a dead german than a living king of england and that if he had to stop in england for a million years he'd still be as german as ever if not more so and he'd also fairly shaken with pride because he'd read somewhere that the kaiser had said that he would give any doctor a hundred thousand marks if he would draw every drop of english blood out of his veins and when he said it tracy had answered that if the kaiser came over to england there were plenty of doctors who would oblige him for half the money but now i thought without any unkind feeling to wundt that i ought to tell travers major as head of the school of his dark threats and i did and travers thanked me and said i was quite right to tell him because war is war and uh, you never know of course if wundt was going to turn out to be a spy it wasn't possible for me to be his friend and i told him so and he saw that he said he was sorry if anything to lose my friendship but he should always do all that he considered right in the service of his country and he couldn't let me stand between him and his duty which amounted to admitting that he was a spy or at any rate was trying to be one for of course at merivale a spy was no more use than he would have been at the north pole there was simply nothing to spy about except the photographs of new girls on brown's mantelpiece then travers made a move and he was sorry to do it but he was going to be a soldier just as much as wundt was and though he never jawed about woolwich like wundt did about potsdam yet he was quite as military at heart and though he didn't wear the english colours inside his waistcoat lining like wundt wore the german colours as he admitted to me in a friendly moment yet travers felt just as keen about england as wundt did about germany and quite as cast down when he heard about mons as wundt was when he heard about the retreat on the marne he pretended of course it was only strategy but he knew jolly well it wasn't 
then travers major reluctantly decided that with a spy certain things must be done he didn't like doing them but they had to be done and the first thing was to prove it you can only prove a chap is a spy by spying yourself travers said and well knowing the peculiar skill of norris and booth he told them to keep a careful lookout on wundt and report anything suspicious which they did so because it was work to which they were well suited by their natures and they soon reported that wundt went long walks out of bounds and evidently avoided people as much as possible once they surprised him making notes and when he saw booth coming he tore them up then travers major did a strong thing and ordered that the box of wundt should be searched i happen to know that wundt was very keen to get a letter off by post which he said was important yet hesitated to send for fear of accidents and that decided travers so it was done quite openly and without subterfuge as they say because we just took the key from wundt by force and told him we were going to do it and then did it he protested very violently but the protest as travers said was not sustained and we found his box contained fearfully incriminating matter for he had a one-barreled breech-loading pistol in it with a box of ammunition of which we had never heard until that moment and a complete map on a huge scale of merivale and the country round it was a wonderful map and how he had made it and nobody ever seen it was extraordinary at least so it seemed till we remembered that he had been here through the holidays on his own there were numbers in red ink all over the map and remarks carefully written in german and though it is impossible to give you any idea of the map which was beautifully drawn and about three yards square if not more yet i can reproduce the military remarks upon it which travers translated into english they went like this and showed in rather a painful way what wundt really was at heart and it showed what germany was too and no doubt thousands of other germans all over the united kingdom had been doing the same thing and still are after the first shock of being discovered i honestly believe he was pleased to be seen in his true colours and gloried in his crime these were the notes in cold blood as you may say one a wood good cover for guns in the middle is a spring where a gamekeeper's wife gets water it might easily be poisoned two a large number of fields some have potatoes in them and some have turnips three a village with fifty or sixty houses and about two hundred and thirty-five inhabitants mostly women and children presents no difficulties four a church with a tower a very good place for wireless or light gun the pews inside would be good for wounded cover for infantry in the churchyard five a stream with one bridge which might easily be blown up but it would not be necessary as the stream is only six feet across and you could easily walk over it too small for pontoons small fish in it six a large field which was planted with corn but is now empty a good place for aeroplanes to land can't find out where corn is gone seven a railroad with one line that goes up to main line could easily be destroyed but might have strategic value eight a hill where guns could be placed that would cover advance of troops on merivale nine the school this stands on rising ground a mile from the hill number eight and could easily be destroyed by field guns or it might easily be used as a hospital it contains a hundred beds and the chapel could easily hold a hundred more there is a garden and a fountain of good water also a well in the house the playing field is a quarter of a mile off tents could easily be put up there for troops ten a village schoolroom three hundred yards from the church it has been turned into a hospital for casualties there are thirteen or fourteen nurses of the red cross waiting for wounded soldiers to arrive they are amateurs but have passed some sort of examination the wounded are said to be coming this place could easily be shelled from the hill marked number eight eleven a forest full of game and in the middle of it a park and the manor house belonging to a man called sir neville carew he has a great wealth and the mansion could easily be looted and then either used for officers or burned down twelve a farm rich in sheep and cattle and chickens also turkeys it would present no difficulties thirteen the sea this is distant ten miles from here and there is an unfortified bay which looks deep 
we went there for a holiday last summer and some of us went out in a boat i pretended to fish and tried to take soundings but regret to report that i failed however the water was quite deep enough for small battlecraft the cliffs are red and made of hard rock there are about twenty fishing boats and a coast guard station on top but i saw no wireless there is a semaphore fourteen a medical doctor's house with a garage would present no difficulties i saw petrol tins in the yard that was all and travers at once decided to hand the map and the pistol and cartridges to dr dunston i'm very unwilling to do it he said but this is a bit too thick altogether it is pure unadulterated spying of the most blackguard sort and if i had anything to do with it i should fine wound every penny he's got and imprison him for six months and then deport him so he took the evidence of guilt to dunston and of course dunston had the day of his life over them some of the masters considered it funny and i believe peacock who translated the map for dunston thought it was rather fine of wundt but old dunston didn't think it was funny or fine either he had the whole school in chapel and hung up the map on a blackboard and waved the pistol first in one hand and then the other and talked as only he can talk when he's fairly roused by a great occasion i believe what hurt him most was wundt saying it would be so jolly easy to knock out merivale and to hear wundt explaining how the school could be shelled fairly made old dunston get on his hind legs in his great moments he always quotes shakespeare and he did now he said he wasn't going to have a serpent sting him twice anyway he also said it was enough to make kant and goethe turn in the graves and that for all he could see they had expended their genius in vain so far as their native land was concerned and then he went on needless to say jacob wundt you are technically expelled i say technically because until i have communicated with your unfortunate father it is impossible literally to expel you to be expelled a boy must be expelled from somewhere to somewhere and for the moment there is nowhere that i know of to where you can be expelled but rest assured that a way shall be found at the earliest opportunity indeed it may be my duty to hand you over to the military authorities and should that be the case i shall not hesitate for the present you are interned wundt merely said ach but he said it in such a fearfully contemptuous tone of voice that the doctor flogged him then and there and travers major thought wundt ought not to have been flogged by rights but treated as a prisoner of war or else shot he didn't seem to be sure which and as for wundt he evidently thought the belgian atrocities were a fool to his being flogged and he got so properly wicked that the doctor had him locked up all night with nothing but bread and water to eat and the gardener to guard him then a good many chaps began to be sorry for wundt but their sorrow was wasted for the very next day dunston heard from his father that wundt could go home through holland with two other german boys who were being looked after by the american ambassador or some such pot in london so he went and after he had gone fortescue asked the doctor if he might have wundt's map as a psychological curiosity or some such thing and dunston said he had burned the map to cinders and seemed a good deal pained with fortescue for wanting to treasure such an outrage wundt promised to write to me when he left but he never did and perhaps if it's true that german boys of sixteen go to the front he may be there now and if he is and if his side wins and if wundt is with the germans when they come to merivale i know the first thing he'll do will be to slay old dunston and the second thing he'll do will be to slay saunders but in the meantime of course there is a pretty rosy chance he may get slain himself not that he'd mind if he knew his side was on top and going to conquer only perish the thought as they say End of story three. Story four of The Human Boy and the War by Eden Philpotts. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story four. Travers Minor, Scout. Before the fearful war with Germany began, Dr. Dunston was not very keen about us joining the Boy Scouts on half holidays. He liked better for us to play games, and if you didn't play games, he liked you to go out with Brown to botanize in the hedges. 
it was a choice of evils to me and travers minor because we hated games and we fairly loathed botanizing with brown unluckily for us he was the foreign master of the lower fourth and so we had more than enough of him in school without seeing him pull weeds to pieces on half holidays and talk about the wonders of nature for that matter he was about the wonderfulest wonder of nature himself if he'd only known it but after the war began old dunston quite changed his attitude to the boy scouts and in some ways that was the best thing that ever happened for me and travers minor though in other ways it was not i'm called briggs and travers minor and i came the same term and chummed from the first we had the same opinions about most things and agreed about hating games and preferring a more solitary life but we were very different in many respects for travers minor was going to be a clergyman and i had no ideas of that sort my father being a stockbroker in the brighton a market travers minor was more excitable than travers major though quite as keen about england and after being divided for some time between the navy and the church he rather cleverly combined the two professions and determined to be the chaplain of a battleship his enthusiasm for england was very remarkable and after a time though i had never been the least enthusiastic about england before yet owing to the pressure of travers minor i got to be nothing like he was of course he used to fairly tremble about england and once when an irish boy who didn't know home rule had been passed said he'd just as soon blow his nose on the union jack as his handkerchief which was rot seeing he never had one young travers flew at him like a tiger from a bow and knocked him down and hammered the back of his head on the floor of the chapel as soon as he had recovered from his great surprise the irish boy rice he was called got up and licked travers minor pretty badly which he could easily do being cock of the lower school but all the same rice respected travers for doing what he did and when he heard that home rule was passed he said that altered the case and never cheeked the english flag again then dunston changed towards the boy scouts and said to such of us as liked might join them and about twenty did we were allowed to hunt about in couples on half holidays and the rule for a boy scout is always to be on the lookout to justify his existence when scouting and to assist people and to help the halt and the lame and tell people the way if they want to know it and buck about generally and if possible never stop a bit of scouting till he's done a good action of some kind to somebody of course we had to do our good actions in bounds and travers minor often pointed out as a rather curious thing that over and over again there were chances to do good actions if we'd gone out of bounds sometimes even over a hedge into a field but he generally found something useful to it and i generally didn't the good action that occurred oftenest was to give pennies to tramps but travers did not support this he said i dare say you've noticed briggs that all these chaps who ask us for money have got starving families at home well if it's true they ought to be at home looking after them but it isn't true as a rule they spend the money on beer and when you ask them why they haven't enlisted they all say they're too short or too tall or haven't got any back teeth or something we were scouting the day travers minor pointed this out and that was the very afternoon that we met the best tramp of the lot i should have believed him myself and tried to help him but travers strangely enough is much kinder to animals and dumb creatures in general than he is to men especially tramps and it took a very clever tramp to make him believe him but this one did he was old and grizzled and gray and his moustache was yellow with tobacco he was sitting rolling a cigarette in the hedge and as we passed together in uniform with our scout poles he got up and saluted us with a military salute what a bit of luck he said you're just the chaps i'm on the lookout for travers stopped and so did i do you want anything my good man said travers yes i do i want a sharp boy scout to listen to me i'm telling secrets mind you but you're in the service just as much as i am and i can trust you what service asked travers minor what service are you in the secret service said the tramp i dare say you think i'm only a badgering old loafer and not worth the price of the boots on my feet far from it i'm sir baden powell's brother that's why i was glad to see you boys come along 
i don't believe it said travers quite right not to answered the old man that is till i explain as you know the country's fairly crawling with german spies at present and it takes a pretty good chap to smell them out that's my game i've run down thirty-two during the last month and i'm on the track of a lot more but to keep up my character of an old tramp i dress like this and then they don't suspect me and i just meet em in pubs and stand em drinks and tip em a bit of their lingo and pretend i'm german too i was a good deal impressed by this and so was travers minor i've been standing drinks to a doubtful customer only this morning and spent my last half-crown doing it went on the great baden powell's brother that's why i stopped you boys i'm a good way from my base for the moment and i shall be obliged if you can lend me half a sovereign or whatever you've got on you till to-morrow if you let me have your address you shall get it by midday and i'll mention your names to be p next time we meet travers minor looked at the spy in a spellbound sort of way it's a wonderful disguise he said not one of my best though answered the man i never look the same two days running very likely to-morrow i shall be a smart young officer and then again i may look like a farmer or a clergyman or anything it's part of my work to be a master of the art of disguises travers minor began to whisper to me and ask how much money i had then the great spy spoke again i might give you boys a job next saturday afternoon but you'll have to be pretty smart to do it i'm taking a german then i've marked him down at little Middleborough, you know a mile from merivale and on saturday next at the woolpack public house i meet him and arrest him i shall want a bit of help i dare say travers fairly trembled with excitement after that then he felt in his pocket and found he'd only got a shilling and this he gave to the spy without a thought but i happened to have five shillings by an extraordinary fluke it being my birthday and brown had changed a postal order from my mother so i was not nearly so keen about the spy as travers minor travers was a good deal relieved to hear i'd got as much and even then apologized that we could only produce six bob between us the spy seemed rather disappointed and i made a feeble effort to keep my five shillings by saying couldn't you get to the police station they'd be sure to have tons of money there but at the mention of a police station he showed the utmost annoyance combined with contempt he said what's your name and i said briggs well briggs he said let me tell you if there's one thing the secret service hates and despises more than another it's a police station and if there's one bigger fool on earth than another it's a policeman it would very likely be death to my whole career as a spy if i went to a policeman and told who i was don't you ever work with them mr baden powell asked travers and he said never if i can help it so he had the six bob much to my regret and told us to be at the woolpack public house at midborough on the following saturday afternoon he asked what would be the most convenient time for us to be there and we said half past three and he said good then travers asked rather a smart question and said how shall we know you and the spy said i shall be disguised as a farmer in gaiters and the sort of clothes farmers go to market in on saturdays and i shall be in the bar with other men and one of these men will be a very dangerous german secret agent who has a wireless in his house and when we've got him we shall go to his house and destroy the wireless and now you'd better be getting on or people will think it suspicious and you shall have your money again next saturday so we left him and the six shillings with him and i was by no means so pleased and excited about it as travers minor still i was excited in a way and hoped the following saturday would be glorious and travers said it would undoubtedly be the greatest day we had spent up to that time we had gone two hundred yards and were wondering what the german would look like and if he'd make a fight when we were much startled by a man who suddenly jumped out of the hedge and stopped us it was a policeman in a very excited frame of mind what did that bloke up the road say to you he began and travers minor remembering what contempt the great spy had for policemen was rather haughty our conversation was a private he answered and the policeman seemed inclined to laugh i know what your conversation was very well he answered soapy william wouldn't tire himself talking to you kids for fun did you give him any money 
in this insolent way the policeman dared to talk of baden powell's brother his name is not soapy william answered travers who had turned red with anger and he's got no use for policemen anyway no you take your dying oath he hasn't said the policeman if he told you that he's broke the record and told you the truth did you give him money or only a fag we lent him money for a private purpose and i'll thank you to let us pass said travers minor but the policeman wouldn't he's as slippery as an eel he said and i've been waiting to cop him red-handed for a fortnight so now you'd better come and overtake him for he's lame and can only crawl along and when i talk to him you'll be surprised you're utterly wrong travers minor told the policeman you're quite on the wrong scent and if you interfere with that man you'll very likely ruin your own career in the force he's much more powerful than you think but the policeman said he'd chance that and then in the name of the law he made us come and help him it was a most curious experience when we got there the spy had disappeared and the policeman knowing that he could only go about one mile an hour said he must be hidden somewhere near and if you chaps are any good as scouts now's your chance to show it he said by this time i began to believe the policeman for he was a big man and very positive in his speech but travers hated him and if he'd found the spy i believe we would have said nothing but i found him or rather i found his boot he had no doubt seen us stopped by the policeman and then hastened to evade capture there was a haystack in a field and he had gone to it and on one side where it was cut open there was a lot of loose hay and he had concealed himself with the utmost cunning all but one boot this i observed just peeping out from a litter of loose hay and not feeling equal to making the capture myself i pretended i had not seen the boot and went off and told the policeman who was hunting some distance off and also eating blackberries while he hunted he was much pleased and hastened to make the capture and when he arrived and he saw the boot he said hello soapy old pard got you this time my boy then the hay was cast aside and the great spy otherwise known as soapy william rose up it was rather a solemn sight in a way for he took it pretty calmly and said he'd been wanting a fortnight's rest for a long time after the capture the policeman seemed to lose interest in travers minor and me in fact he didn't even thank us but he gave us back our money and it was rather interesting to find that soapy william besides our six shillings had the additional sum of two and seven pence halfpenny also travers minor didn't speak one single word going back to merivale until we were at the gates then he said a thing which showed how fearfully he felt what had happened he said it makes me feel almost in despair about going into the church briggs when there's such wickedness as that about and i said i should think you would want to go in all the more and afterwards when we had changed and had tea and we were in school he got calmer and admitted i was right but he took a gloomier view of human nature afterwards and often on scouting days he said there was more satisfaction in helping a beetle across a road or making a snail safe than there was in trying to be useful to one's fellow creatures we had to go and give evidence against soapy william before a justice of the peace two days later in fact it was sir neville carew who lived at the manor house and he seemed to be very much amused at our evidence and almost inclined to let soapy off but he gave him a fortnight and soapy said to us as he hoped we'd let the great bed and powell know how he was being treated and everybody laughed including brown who had gone to the court with us but after that dr dunston cooled off to the boy scouts a lot and when the terrific adventure to travers minor finally occurred about three weeks after travers major said it was a nemesis on old dunston and so undoubtedly it was though not actually in it i heard all the particulars in fact everybody did for naturally dr dunston was the most famous person in merivale and when this remarkable thing overtook him the merivale weekly trumpet had a column about it and everybody for miles round called to see him and say how jolly glad they were it wasn't worse 
it was a fierce afternoon with the leaves flying and the rain coming down in a squally sort of way and travers minor and i went for a drill and after the drill we scouted a bit on rather a lonely road where nothing was in the habit of happening but as travers truly said the essence of scouting is surprise and because a road is a lonely and uneventful sort of road it doesn't follow something may not happen unexpectedly upon it he said no doubt the roads in the valley of the river and in france have been pretty lonely in their time but think of them last september so we went and one motor passed us in two miles and two dogs poaching together also passed and in a field was a sheep which had got on its back and couldn't get up again being too fat to do so we pulled it up in another field was a bull and we tried to attract it and scouted down a hedge within fifty yards of it to see if it was dangerous and warn people if it was and i went to within forty yards of it being a good twelve yards from the hedge at the time but it paid no attention then just at the end of the road we came across an old woman sitting by the roadside in a very ragged and forlorn condition with a basket of watercresses and also about twelve mushrooms thinking she might be lame or otherwise in difficulties travers minor went up to her and said good evening do you want anything and she said yes a plucky lot of things but none of your cheek it wasn't meant for cheek i'm a scout said travers minor and she said oh run along home and ask mother to let out your knickers else you'll bust em travers turned white with indignation but such was his great idea of discipline that he didn't tell her she was a drunken old beast which she was but just marched off but he was fearfully upset all the same and instead of pouring out his rage on the horrid old woman he poured it out on me he had been a bit queer all day owing to a row with brown over a history lesson in which travers minor messed up the story of charles the second and now what with one thing and another he lost his usual self-control and got very nasty he said scouting with another person was no good not with me anyway and i said what have i done and he said you're such a fathead nothing ever happens when you're about i told him to keep his temper and not make a silly ass of himself i also asked him what he thought was going to happen i said we all know you're always ready for anything from an ulan to a caterpillar but it seems to me the essence of scouting is to keep wide awake when nothing is happening like the fleet in the north sea any fool can do things the thing is always to be ready to do them and not get your shirt out and lose your nerve because there's nothing to do this good advice fairly settled travers minor he undoubtedly lost his temper as he admitted afterwards and he said when i want you to tell me my business briggs i'll let you know and i said your first business is to keep your hair on whatever happens and he said then i'll relieve you of my company briggs and before i could answer he had got through the hedge and gone off over a field which ran along a wood i watched him in silent amazement as they say and he crossed the field and entered the wood and disappeared this action alone showed what a proper rage he was in because he had gone into the manor woods which was not only going out of bounds but also trespassing two things he never did it was a fearful loss of nerve and i stood quite still for a good minute after he vanished then my first idea was to go and lug him back but discretion was always the better part of valor with me and always will be owing to my character so i left travers to his fate and hoped he'd soon cool down and come back without meeting a keeper it was growing dusk too and i went to merivale and decided not to say anything about travers minor except that while we were engaged in some scouting operations i had missed him i only heard the amazing tale of his adventure afterwards and though everybody had the story in some shape or form i got the naked truth from travers minor himself in his own words next morning much to our surprise it was given out that dr dunstan was unwell and fortescue read prayers and during that event travers told me all when i left you he said i was in a filthy bait and for once instead of not wanting to trespass and break bounds i did want to and i went straight into the manor woods and badly frightened some pheasants that had gone to roost and was immediately soothed 
they made a fearful row and i thought a keeper would be sure to spring up from somewhere and rather hoped one would in order to afford me an opportunity for an escape but nothing happened and i decided to walk on till i came to the drive and then boldly go along out of the lodge gate well i walked through the wood to the drive just before it got dark i was looking out cautiously from the hedge of the wood to see that all was clear when i observed a man sitting on the edge of the drive for a moment i thought it was that wretched soapy william again he was humped up and nursing his foot which was evidently badly wounded then the man gave a sound between a sigh and a groan and a snuffle and i saw it was dr dunstan of course it was the moment of my life and i felt in a sort of way that my whole future career depended upon my next action my first instinct remembering that norris and booth were both flogged when caught here was a strategic retreat but then my duty as a boy scout occurred to me it was a fearful choice of evils you may say for if i cleared out i was disgraced forever and my mind couldn't have stood it and if i went forward i was also disgraced forever because to be flogged to a chap with my opinions is about the limit i considered what should be done and while i was considering it old dunstan groaned again and said out loud tut tut this is indeed a tragedy that decided me because the question of humanity came in and looking on into the future in rather a remarkable way i saw at once that if i retreated and heard next morning that old dr dunstan was found dead i should feel the pangs of remorse for evermore and they would ruin my life i also felt that if i saved him he was hardly likely to flog me because there would undoubtedly be a great feeling against him if he did you might have done this i said you might have retreated and then gone down to the lodge and told the woman that there was an injured man in great agony lying halfway up the drive you might have given a false name yourself and then when the rescuing party started you might have cleared out and so remained anonymous it would have gone down to the credit of the boy scouts and old dunstan would have been the first to see that the particular boy scout in question preferred for private reasons to keep his identification a secret travers was much impressed by this view i never thought of that he said probably if i had i should have done it anyway i'm sorry i swore at you and called you a fathead briggs you're not a fathead far from it he then continued his surprising narrative in these words anyway i decided to rescue the doctor and stepped out of ambush and said good evening sir i'm afraid you're hurt he was evidently very glad to see me but you know his iron discipline he kept it up even then what boy are you he asked and i told him i was travers minor from merivale and how comes it you are here he asked again i was operating in the woods on my way home sir and i heard your cry of distress we will investigate your operations on another occasion then said the doctor for the moment mine are more important i have had a bad fall and am in great pain you had better run as quickly as possible to the manor house ask to see sir neville carew and tell him that i have met with a very severe accident halfway down his drive whether i have broken my leg or put out my ankle it is not for me to determine i have been drinking tea with sir neville and learning his views as to the war be as quick as you can you will never have a better opportunity to display your agility then i hooked it and ran the half mile or so to the manor house sprinting all the way i soon gave the terrible news and in about ten minutes sir neville carew himself with his butler and his footman set off for the doctor and the footman trundled a chair which ran on wheels and which sir neville carew kindly explained to me he uses himself when he gets an attack of gout which often happens unfortunately he didn't ask me how i discovered the accident which was naturally rather a good thing for me and when we got back to the doctor he told me to hasten on in advance and break the evil tidings so i cleared out and i've heard no more yet but no doubt i shall soon that was the great narrative of travers minor and after morning school brown gave out that the doctor's ankle was very badly sprained but that things would take their course as usual and a bulletin be put up on the notice-board in the evening and it was and it said the doctor was better 
Travers Minor heard nothing until three days later, when the doctor appeared on a crutch and read prayers. Then he had Travers up and addressed the school, and Travers saw at a glance that Dr. Dunstan was still in no condition to flog him, even if the will was there. It ended brilliantly for Travers, really because the doctor said he had been an instrument of providence, and he evidently felt you ought not to flog an instrument of providence, whatever he's been doing. He reproved Travers Minor pretty stiffly all the same, and said that when he considered what a friend Sir Neville Carew was to the school, and how much he overlooked and so on, it was infamous that any boy should even glance into his pheasant preserves, much less actually go into them. And Travers Minor was finally ordered to spend the half-holiday in visiting Sir Neville Carew, and humbly apologizing to him for his conduct which he did so and sir neville carew on hearing from travers that he would never do it again on any pretext whatever was frightfully sporting and forgave him freely and talked about the war and reminded him about sir baden powell's brother and ended by taking travers minor into a glass house full of luscious peaches and giving him two and Travers kept one for me, because he said if it hadn't been for getting into a wax with me, he would never have trespassed and never have had the adventure at all. And I said it wasn't so much me as that beast of an old woman who told him his knickers were too tight. In strict honesty, I said, she ought to have this peach. Then I ate it, and I never want to eat a better. In fact, I kept the stone to plant when I went home. End of story four.